Amalia, before this mass and scene, has had a ripple that tells her that she will be at his estate. Mary's death needs to be answered and not with another death. I'm going to talk to Matson alone. The confrontation scene between Amalia and Masson is really interesting. You think that I had something to do with your friend's death? Did you? It saved me such a lot of time. We flip roles, and he, uncharacteristically, as you would think, simply goes along with it. You'll take the part of the mastermind behind Mary's death. And you will be the irate inspector? I'll be Mary. You wouldn't have thought that would happen in a conventional 1899 drama with conventional gender stereotypes. These people are role-playing in a way that's really very modern as a way of trying to find the truth of the situation. But an amazing scene to shoot because it's just so ambivalent and ambiguous the whole time. And wonderful to get, you know, toe to toe with Laura in that scene. And that was my favorite day, I think, really so far. It was great having that scene with him and also a scene that it's kind of two adversaries, but nobody saying anything in clear and plain language. If I am, your killer revealed. Behold, the lion, Great Britain, an empire unparalleled and unmerciful in its self-preservation. Filming at Nebworth is incredible because it's this huge Gothic Tudor building with so much history, and it seems fitting that something that solid and powerful has a man who would be that solid and powerful. So it's very much embodies mass and spirit. Nebworth has these extraordinary gates with vast great dragons on them, so the exterior is fantastic, but the inside's lovely as well. When you look at old Victorian photographs to any of the interiors of Victorian prominent gentlemen, you would find a lot of them would have hunting trophies and, and things on the wall to do the interior of Masson's estate. You're looking at maybe not antiques and furniture from that Victorian period, because they would often have them maybe 50 or 100 years earlier. So you're looking at really fine antiques. Amalia notices all his hunting trophies and his armor, and it speaks to his power, I think. I suppose you can say Masson is a villain. In modern day, he looks like a villain in his black and his high collar. Actually, that was just what men wore then. I love the way the men have to hold their head with these incredibly high collars sometimes. What I really enjoy is as the costume develops, you see the character emerge, particularly Amalia with the corset. It was incredibly important that she would really want to be controlled and precise. Some anarchic cabal found or developed a power that mocks God. It was an attack on the empire. So we're at war. Masson doesn't believe that the touched represent progress of any good kind. He is the living, breathing embodiment of the patriarchy and power as it exists in that society. Masson embodies that empire and the values of that empire, and if that means people being sacrificed, then that's the way it's going to go. Masson, I suppose, is fundamentally a bad guy in that he's about destroying the touch. We always ask ourselves about villains, how did they get to be like this? With Masson, he lost his wife young, and now he's lost a child. So that makes him rather compelling. If you have a personal tragedy, all that does is fortify your allegiance to the larger force, so the larger British Empire for Masson. There's a regular power play between Masson and Amalia. He's the old power, she represents the new power, and neither one of them is going to give that up easily. So I think she comes out of there feeling frustrated and angry. So he confessed without confessing. It was honestly impressive. Amalia is looking for how she is supposed to be moving forward, but she really is quite lost. I was left here completely alone, with nothing but a mission I was never actually given. She is learning where to find the information that she needs, and the thing that really sets that in motion, first of all, of course, is, is hearing Mary's song. Myrtle's turn. She can speak every language, she can understand every language. So she does understand everything Mary's saying. She also knows she cannot say what it means. She can't communicate that with anyone. 
and she knows that this is life-changing for everyone around her. When Mary sang, you heard words, language. Primrose and Harriet kind of sees this opportunity. She's trying to communicate with us what she heard Mary sing. We tried really hard to include as many as we could, you know, Asian languages, Afrin languages, European languages. It was a little bit dictated by what contacts we had. Para todos de vocês. Viola's a remarkable person because she's so good at picking up the sounds and the rhythms of a language and the tune of a language. She kind of absorbs that very, very quickly. Do we clean that the Amalia mein einsamer Zordat hat Zordat? A little slower. But I think we both felt we want to do justice here. If we're going to use a bit of Afrikaans, if we're going to use a bit of Dutch or Turkish or whatever it is, we want to try and do that justice. Venite the prima che sia buio. So I put out an email to the whole crew. The response was phenomenal. Loads of people got involved and translated pieces of script for us. We had something of like 30, 40 languages. I just thought it was fantastic. It was really joyous, this coming together. It's sadly quite unusual in the world for so many different cultures to come together and help each other. We had some very, very interesting debates. You know, I'd say, oh, um, can you say because of the darkness? And people would say, when you say darkness, what do you mean? Do you mean total black? Do you mean uh, night time? I know it, dark. dark. And uh, before the dark, uh, come before the dark. See, <laughs> that's so incredible that we're going into this detail and you suddenly realise that English has some words that cover some things, but other languages have amazing words. It's just really exciting because it's the coming together of a lot of different people who speak a lot of different languages and can't necessarily communicate with one another clearly, but still have the ability to do it regardless. They're able to find out what Mary's song meant. So that's finally a message. What did she say? Uh, she said you're not alone. She said it to you, Mrs. True. And there's a darkness. She said to everyone, all of us. So it's really just a kind of blind scrape through the dark to get where she needs to get in the hope that there is some light at the end of that. Was there more? Find me? Who do we need to find?